Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. The title is The Efficiency of Civilizations. To be honest, the title first came to me designing colossal events of kindness. But then as I was uh, making notes on how I could envision that, that I noticed the efficiency of civilizations as a more complete title of uh, what I would like to communicate here. You know, in this life, I have heard sentences that small acts of kindness can change the world. <clears throat> and I looked at what I consider, I mean, an act of kindness is that it's a conscious decision. That means the difference between being kind and unkind, that you can be unkind whether you're conscious or not. You can consciously be unkind or you can unconsciously be unkind. But kindness, you can only be consciously kind, you know. And if there is unconscious kindness, it's not conscious. That means it's like something's uh, working through the moment rather than as the moment. So, if a small act of kindness is a conscious activity, is a conscious decision, Then we can say any moment in our life where we are unconscious of ourself, we are being unkind to ourself. Now, when it comes to simple acts of kindness, like, I don't know, holding the door open, picking up trash, helping someone, you know, simple acts of kindness. They can be inspired momentarily if they're too easy. I can honestly say when I've been energetic, my kindness has been, has been more. <laughs> you know, I think kindness is a quality of energetic people, you know. <laughs> if you're tired, you don't, have, you don't have the time to be kind, you know. <laughs> That's the world we live in today, you know. We are, we know kindness helps, but we're not too busy or it's too much of a commitment, you know. We have built a civilization that is comfortable watching from a distance. So anyways, if small acts of kindness, because uh, here's the thing, imagine we want to build an advanced civilization. <clears throat> we notice the word kind is literally in our species, mankind, you know, like we can't get kinder than that. You know? <laughs> so if we try to design a system where small acts of kindness are very quick and 
if we were to envision a, a, a collective act of kindness aside from religious philanthropist works so i'm not talking about like a, a, a charity or something like that the charities of today i don't know who they're a charity for <laughs> <coughs> but <laughs> My whole point is a colossal event of kindness and we require to consciously design it. Now <clears throat> in other talks and other discussions in other places even in the School of Athens 2.0 I've shared this idea, I don't know if I've shared it with others in person but um, Pretty much there's a point system I see. I see that uh, in video games, when the person completes a quest, they experientially expand, Do you know? They attain something. When you look at what's really inspiring people, honestly, if we didn't have an economical system, you know, I mean, sometimes I think if everybody was a billionaire, <laughs> can you imagine if we realize all right so wait wait a minute bro on a rock in the middle of nowhere can everybody just <laughs> can we just make everybody billionaires overnight is this possible you know <clears throat> we would have no ambition when the work is done what work is there to do There's a motivation. People are motivated by trying to survive in a man-made system. And of course, finance is very crucial. It's like literally like food. You gotta find it somehow. I saw this sort of honor point system. I feel uh, modern civilizations, they have dishonored themselves because we feel that it's progress to disagree with the past rather than coming new models for the future. Belief or disbelief in the past is a waste of time. It's done, it's past. Past is past. <clears throat> so imagine there was this honor point system, and any person who did an act of kindness got one honor point. Imagine, I'm just going with this riffing right now with this idea. But um, imagine they got one, one point. You know, you, you helped, uh, you picked up a trash, you got point. And we had imagine these spherical, uh, like imagine we wouldn't have phones in the future. We would have these spheres hovering, hovering a meter above our air following. Everybody would have a sphere following them. That sphere would be the type of phone they have. So I'm saying that if, if, if in the future there is a surveillance sort of sphere, just like a meter above the person said, I mean, think about it, you could be a kid in the future, and if you have the sphere surveillance phone kind of te technology, do you know that means anybody can go anywhere safely because the sphere can just go in the A and it's in the air and it's recording everything. <clears throat> but I'm saying if we had this sort of surveillance sphere, following us around and every person who picked up trash who actually did any kindness it was recorded and they got a point for it some sort of point which could translate into towards some sort of economical means you know of course if when we have phones like that most likely we've we've transcended um currency <clears throat> but anyways the whole point of the po point of what i'm saying is that uh Right now, acts of kindness are not being watched and they don't have a value. Can you imagine if every time you picked up trash, some billionaire out of nowhere appeared and just gave you, uh, I don't know, like $200, you know? 
seems seems like a what a, what a billionaire would give away. <laughs> Imagine every little thing you did had some sort of point system value, and we call that system honor, an honor point system. So anytime you helped an old lady with their bags across the street, you got honor points. Imagine we build a civilization where we were not looking for currency. We were not trying to find money at any cost, but we were just trying to add honor points. These honor points are very valuable because those people who are gentle-natured get rewarded. Usually in this type of civilization we've built, uh, it's, it's kind of messed up where, to be honest, it's still a jungle. That means animals rule the kingdom. <laughs> We haven't, honestly, even though we've had many types of monarchies and uh, kingships in, in history, but I'm telling you, we are literally like, uh, we're still in the jungle. But it's a jungle we have made. That's the difference. There is a quote, there is a poem from Sadi, this Persian poet. He says, human beings, he said this, I think, 800 years ago. Human beings are members of a whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole. Human beings are members of a whole. In creation of one essence and soul, if one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. <clears throat> and that's the thing, right? If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. And this, the honor system would abide by a morality of these last two sentences. Because really, that's what sets us apart from other animals. You know, sometimes when I see a lion eating a gazelle, like in National Geographic or something, I'm like, okay, does that lion know what it's doing? Does that gazelle know what it's doing? Or is it just each of them is in their own room of animal psychology, never knowing what they're doing to the other? There's something strange that even though two people may have a conversation, or you may have a conversation with lots of people, but nobody's inner realms is the same. It's like the blessing of our minds, that we are <clears throat> diverse, yet when we look at ourselves on a species level, we are not that uh, separate. We are reaching a time where in the outer realms, we must honor diversity, and in the inner realms, we must honor uh, <clears throat> unity. In the, uh, in the outer realms, we must honor uniqueness. In the inner realms, we must honor unity. The efficiency of civilizations. <clears throat> when I think about that, it transcends more than a thought and it becomes like a film. Where I think about what was efficient by what people have done in the past. You know, what makes a civilization efficient? I mean, when you think about a person, what makes a person efficient? It's resources. But when you think about what makes a civilization efficient, it's the people's minds that are the resources. The civilization doesn't have a mind of its own until AI becomes our president. But I'm saying like... <laughs> Just 
to build an efficient civilization i mean really what i when we look back it was something that was more of a universal archetype and there was love it sounds you know in modern times we have made love into lust literally you know <clears throat> but i can tell you the notion of love was care and the notion of caring transcended ideology you know because sometimes i look at it what continued i mean so many human beings have lived but why have our history books chosen those names you know why have those names remained there was a story of these two brothers back in the day in ancient greece and one of the brothers would go out and speak a lot you know and one of the brothers was silent one of the brothers Cher wrote a lot of different books and whatnot and shared it at the times and was very outspoken. The other brother just wrote one book. Now, the whole point of this story is this story is not told by someone who knew these brothers. This story was told by someone years and years after <clears throat> because a thousand years after everything that the brother that uh, was sharing all the uh, books and be, be really speaking it was as if the one book of the brother that spoke less stood around for a thousand years what the other brother did maybe like a hundred two hundred years do you know What really makes a work of art or a work of literature or any type of energy expression in this plane is that when you love something, you do it from freedom. If you fear something, if you have a mindset of fear, you don't do it out of freedom. Anything you set into motion in the outer realms outside of a state of freedom does not echo back freedom. Not that this is an absolute, but just the notion that we are inputting the way we're going to receive the output. So I want to point, point it out that it was care, it was a sort of compassion, it was a universal value, it was honoring what felt like truth at the time because every generation has its simulations you know every generation has its obstacles there's no human being that life is easy because let me tell you we don't have the same definition of easy and hard <clears throat> so if small acts of kindness i mean honestly history was made from small acts of kindness some people they were scribes they were like how editors are being treated in the film industry nobody sees the editor but the editor contributed very significantly similarly so many history books have been written but those people who passed on those history books who shared those history books who spread them around the, the scribes of this world they actually kindness has kept history alive even though history has been unkind extremely cruel events have taken place in history but it has been kindness that has uh, allowed some dude to be like, all right, maybe I know how to write. Maybe I should write this book down because there's nobody else who can go do it. Can you imagine? <clears throat> so. Now, if we were to design a colossal act of kindness, 
most likely we would have formations of groups. So imagine one person picking up trash in order to encourage bigger events of kindness happening on the planet. We have to make, uh, uh, like this is going to sound hilarious, but we got to make kindness delicious. <laughs> we got to make kindness feel like a desire for people. Do you know what I mean? This is, this is so true. I am telling you, you could have the most angriest, most violent, savage man in front of a beautiful woman. Suddenly the woman asking them to do something, you know, sir, can you please uh, put this luggage onto the <laughs> whatever, you know, and the person in that instant becomes like, a, you know, what, what is a dog in the streets becomes a puppy in front of a beautiful woman. Yeah. <laughs> What I mean by that is that when you care for something, there's more potential of kindness. And so, if we can create a system where imagine like kids in school, what are they doing? They're, I mean, so the reason what I learned from social media is that, holy shit, how much time do people have? You know, <laughs> that's what, when I check Instagram, that's all I see. I'm like, wow, everybody's a filmmaker nowadays, you know? But most people are filming themselves rather than sharing the film that is behind their eyes. You know, <clears throat> we are all capable minds. There's no such thing as stupidity. The person who came up with the, I mean, there is foolishness, but f the fool can change. That means just a stupidity. When you say somebody is stupid, that means it's like a robot. That means they have no potential to change. But as long as you're a human being, you can just perceive through a different angle and change. That means whatever uh, phase of life you are, you know. To connect in a, another idea here, let's entertain the notion Let's say you're a kid in an advanced civilization and there's an honor system and there's that surveillance kind of spear phone hovering that's recording every point you do. Now you imagine you had heard you have heard to Mr. Mr. Within talks from hundred years ago. I'm just, I just want to share this notion that in, in other talks I've spoken about elemental groups, elemental units. What I mean is that right now, the way we're studying personality, we're uh, fragmenting it into emotions and relating emotions to different colors, and then uh, there's a plethora of complexity that follows. But imagine we divided personalities like old school, like we were earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Okay. Now ether, I'll keep that at pause for now, but imagine all children in the world, they were branded an element. You know, that means kids who were very gentle and quiet, they were uh, given the water element, you know. Kids who were angry and vicious and they had been to the principal's office a couple times, they were given the fire element, you know? Those kids who were progressive in the school were given the wind element. And those kids who, um, you know, they went back to the ground, you know? <laughs> there was the earth element. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that when you it's not okay to define people but when you create a game and people voluntarily go become players in the game then they, technically they define themselves so that's like what happens when you see sports you know that person who goes and is like a striker on a football pitch you know uh, about to hit that soccer ball to the crossbar and have it go in you know that soccer player has a life outside of that field of activity. 
just like as I'm speaking here, I personally, not, not even personally, I impersonally have a life somewhere else. Not that it's a location, not that it's a shape and form. It's, it's, it's just that um, our eyes are not our body, but because we have our, uh, our eyes through our body, there's no other way for us to conceive our eyes. So as long as we are visual, vi visual and conception based, um, we, our conception is visual based um, uh, beyond the visual if, uh, there's literally we're denying ourselves any sort of explanatory power beyond anything that's visual <clears throat> and I feel that's a mistake it's a mistake to imagination that appears naturally to deny it the issue is when when it comes to the implementation, you see, it's not like we want a hundred percent rational society and hundred percent irrational. First of all, it's imp impossible to make both of them. First of all, it's impossible to make a rational, completely rational civilization because we have emotions. Sometimes we get emotional. We do things that don't make sense or irrational, you know. And it's hundred. It's incapable, impossible to make hundred percent irrational because irrationality and chaos gets boring, you know. In Greek mythology, there was chaos, and then the chaos evolved into order. And the gods popped out. <laughs> so you see what I mean? So that order is the evolution of chaos. We should think that um, uh, everybody starts from a chaotic state, and as they live in life, they begin uh, designing an order. chat section super quiet so when I think about this point system this honor point system and these elemental units of children their personalities being like earth air fire water then we would be able to make groups of five ether I don't know yet I haven't thought that far to think how I would define ether I have I have an idea on it but not enough it, it hasn't brewed enough for me to share in the talks but I'll tell you imagine kids were in the groups okay here I'll, I'll share think of this as a prototype version of the idea so in this honor system children want honor honor has become more valuable than money but when you ask children what's this honor <clears throat> this honor is points at legit points okay these points allow you advantages in society now if we have these elemental units that would mean we would have imagine earth air fire water personalities all in the same unit <coughs> Kushwu in the chat section says everything is coming down to designing, isn't it? Yes, Kushwu. It took us four billion years to be able to design these sentences. You know, <laughs> design is the opportunity of individualism. People don't realize this. They think it's just, you know. I mean, not to not to take anything away from non-duality because it's not possible. <laughs> but um. I don't know. I for me, everything is everything is existing in a design dimension. I entertain in my life the complete presence of a geometrical dimension. That means the same way we are right now all being people in this plane of existence. I per, uh, in my at least in, in my inner realms, I have to some degree perceived the sort of complete geometrical dimension to all phenomena. The geometrical dimension is very. I wouldn't say it's real, but I wouldn't say it's unreal. That's the cool thing about it. It's its own um, <clears throat> face of the world. 
So children in these elemental units will have access to a group of different personalities. They will all learn from each other. The, the kid who's shy learns from the angry. The water element learns from the fire element. The wind element learns from the earth element. And the ether I thought of has to be a friend that in every social circle comes and goes. Do you know? Now, I don't, I don't know if this is going to be, this is probably not something to implement now. Now there is something missing in civilization and that's trust. And the reason is, is because we, not everybody is, has resources. So eventually people get vicious, very common sense. You know, there's a hundred, imagine there's 8 billion thirsty people. There isn't water for everyone. So those people who don't get water, what do they do? They come to take water, you know? So when the moment they take water, morality is out of the door. When morality is out of the door, then anarchy is already uh, uh, running in the streets. You see, the efficiency of civilization has to do with the vision. Just like a captain moves a ship, now Mr. Within is saying, hey, 8 billion creatures on a rock in the middle of nowhere. Maybe we should care about where the ship is going. If you were to ask Buckminster Fuller or Marshall McLuhan, they would say spaceship Earth. Buckminster Fuller, I think it was in the 1930s or something, this dude was sh telling people he would have these long 18, like one of his lectures went 18 hours. <clears throat> they would speak about Spaceship Earth, the universe man. Buckminster Fuller would speak about the universe man. The man, the human being that doesn't see itself as just, oh, you're happy with the flag. On, we, color, we colored the face of the earth and we, we just hold flags in there. That's, is that what we deserve or are we a universal civilization? Right now, we're just opening up to the global. If we can speed through the global, we would access the universal. When we access the universal, we will be an interstellar civilization. When we are an interstellar civilization, there will have been enough crystallization of the human form that I think at that point, if human beings are still around, they are no longer, the concept of human being is long gone. Either, they have trans either we have transcended speech, <clears throat> I don't know, it's like a, the future is astonishing, even though it hasn't happened yet. Wow, so Kushwa in the chat section says, we have a practice here in India. Uh, we draw intense ge geometrical de geometry design using sand in temple and traditional homes. Early morning to start a day vision of designing day every day. Yeah, that's definitely very important the, the, with the sand relationship. Even Kushwa in the Zen tradition, they have this thing where it's as if when they are it's like when you are doing something, just do that in the moment. Geometry is so significant. I can't tell you. There has been mo I have, like in my youth, geometry class, I was like, okay, teacher, can you stop talking so we can all go? You know, like that was my interest when I was young. <laughs> but then my interest later on increased to geometry when I, it communicated to me from my inner realms. I had geometrical experiences in my inner realms to a strange point where I have a strange <clears throat> ability to, I don't know, I think we all have this ability. I think we just don't give ourselves the permission to experience how our unconscious is moving the world simultaneously as our conscious life is giving it a reference. Because for me, as much as a black hole is mysterious, the notion of a mirror, just the notion that we're a creature designed to, it sees its hands, its legs, its body, but we don't see our face. We are literally a creature designed to open our eyes facelessly. Then we find a mirror and we're like, no way, is that, who is that in the mirror? <laughs> and Jacques Lacan says the mirror effect, the child in, in youth, suddenly that's the most important moment, how you are accepting a model of your individualism to yourself.
design is very crucial everything has design in it every type of work you do it, it's like when you want to study the mechanics of something you're just pretty much studying how it works <clears throat> but you study it from different angles you can engineer something forward or you can reverse engineer something sometimes for me I reverse engineer concepts in these talks then simultaneously I engineer back at a faster speed The efficiency of civilizations has, has its fate and destiny now in the behavior of the individual members of that civilization. Sometimes I think <clears throat> that um, do we need people to be nice? Imagine everybody becomes nice. Then we're like, okay, it's boring. Do we want everybody to be cool? We're like, no, everybody gets cool. Everything gets destroyed. Everybody lose more than we win. You know, that means I'll tell you, for me, I notice sometimes some of my friends, I, I, I mean, I, I don't tell them this, but <laughs> I measure them in regards to how much they care for short term victory than long term victory. Someone who cares for long term victory, their character is strong in, in short battles. Someone who wants short-term victory, their character is weak. That's why they just want to get something in the short term. They just want some sort of expression, you know, so just so before the person closes their eyes, before they sleep, they're like, I did something, you know. But I'll be honest, it's like you can take yourself seriously even before the idea of yourself was there. So... You're a child, you're in your elemental unit, you know, and suddenly, let's say, in your elemental unit, let's say, um, I could totally see, I mean, we have to, it's just a, a event creation. I think something incredible will happen, maybe in the next 20 years, where lots of event planners are going to seek scholars. Because here's the thing, we are, have no longer a need for physical war, but we're still creatures that want to express intensity. Now the safest battlefield to fight is the inner realms in language, in argument, in discourse, or in cyberspace. Or maybe on a chessboard, like a, a, these, these three I would say, or in a sport or something. But aside from that, there's no reason to break things anymore. We broke things because we were, uh, we were savage and we were scared. That means that if you as a human you attain some sort of fearlessness, fearlessness in this life. I will tell you, your genetical, your DNA will be proud of you. <laughs> that means, technically it's strange, is it not, that our genetical pattern, our DNA, which has been passed down like a torch, who knew our ancestors were all Olympians, you know, in the bedroom. <laughs> it's like right now, there is something I have in common with my early, with my ancestry, and at the same time, everything else is uncommon. So technically, I am the residue, or I am the continuity of a lineage of lifetimes. Technically, what the genetical program is doing is reincarnation. But it's re never being 100% pure. 
technically our genes are reincarnating. When you care for the greater human being within, you have cared for the greater humanity without. The work that is to be done in front of the eyes requires the parameters of stillness and silence from the eye. As silence and stillness become the wings of the angel, The attention of the human being puts down the thought of the human being like a weapon it has held too long and for an instant where all worlds are here. Those who bow to the void You have remembered what was here before language stepped into the halls of your mind. Decency, <clears throat> sincerity, compassion, allowance, tolerance, vision, and the king of the interstellar efficiency. I am telling you, efficiency will become the greatest law, the only law that transforms the rest. That means that's how I process every moment. I just think about, is it efficient? Is it inefficient? And anything I notice that's inefficient, I don't brand it like a, like what are, what are we savages branding objects with names like you know how they do it did it in like the movies with like they branded cows or whatever like <clears throat> back in the day <clears throat> so I'm telling you it's like for me I have I have caressed um, the gentleness of this world I have managed to lose an illusion and attain a truth unborn. The I is not the eyes. As new lights shine the sky, 
as the highway of stars is remembered. We will one day look at this earth and realize the airport it was, the multidimensional airport it was. So if we have a point system, and if children are in groups where they're, they're learning from different kinds of personalities and natures, and we have an honor system, and we have a sort of lineage creation, what that means is like, can you imagine honor returning? Can you imagine the archaic revival of the, an advanced honor? I mean, I'll read something for you. Let's see how the dictionary defines honor. Okay. High respect, great esteem. A person or thing that brings esteem. A title of respect or form of address given <clears throat> to a circuit. circuit uh, okay, let's move on. The quality of knowing and doing what is morally right. Something regarded as a rare opportunity and bringing pride and pleasure. A thing conferred as a distinction, a special distinction for proficiency in examination, a course of degree or company. An ace, king, queen, jack, or <laughs> possession in one's hand, or at least four of the. And okay, and in regards to the verb, regard with great respect. And fulfill an obligation or keep an argument. Okay, let, agreement. There we go. Let's go with that one. It's a, it's the definition of it as a verb, but fulfill. <clears throat> Honor is filling the void of a meaningless temporary life with consciously. Imagine that every human being, it doesn't matter, like right now everybody has a part-time job, I'm saying like these jobs, imagine they had incredible value on a collective level. Mr. Within will declare it civilization 1.0. It's not that it has failed, but it has failed to speed up. And now civilization 2.0 is being ushered in, a yin-yang civilization where the language is the universality of the human being that our eyes are not just our as terence mckenna says it hilariously ethnocentric breastfeeding that means it's like you're not just what you know <clears throat> you're all that you can know By the way, um, anybody who's listening, if, if people dislike the music, you can write a comment. And um, <clears throat> for me, either way, I'm listening to the music, so it doesn't matter. <sighs> we live for the future not seeing the present because the past pushed us. The modern man, the modern human being, the modern creature, it has played the games of selfishness for too long. For how long can you be selfish? <clears throat> After some point, reality settles in. And reality doesn't wait. And you see that this world has a cruelty, yet its cruelty is not intentional. 
it is just the design that we are on earth but people are living for the afterlife that means if we are in life what's the point of missing out on life to then see what's after you know it's like life is happening now the microphone is given once <clears throat> to the hand of every formed being it's too peculiar you know just the fact that we are conscious of our mortality makes me feel what is looking at change what is aware that it's it's changing how can we be aware that it's changing All these children in elemental units, they start getting honor points. Each honor point they get, they go up a higher level. Eventually, competition for honor begins. That means we start, just like how we have these, I don't know, what is it, like these 85 million audience video games, you know, they have like their own call, uh, stadiums or whatever. Imagine we had that on an honor point system based on kind activity. So we just had to find, you see, it's like a win-win solution. I remember I met this person, uh, there was a point in my life, this is way back, this is like, you can say 2011, <clears throat> around that time, um, where I, uh, I was actually trying to go into business. I was studying business for some time. And um, I found a person who was... Uh, financial advisor who was coming to recruit people and just in a very simple way the guy was just waiting around and there was a lineup of people with like suit uh, dressed up in suits and resumes waiting to talk to this guy but this guy's just waiting there as if the event hasn't started and he's, the lineup is quiet and waiting each of them are waiting now i noticed they're all waiting so i go straight up and i talk to the guy <laughs> They're all, all these guys are with suits and resumes waiting. The guy's standing in front of them, but the first guy is shy or something. He's trying to look cool. He's not talking to him, right? So I go and start talking to the person and I'm like, hey, what are you doing here? Can you imagine usually when you ask that from a, someone who's in a very high position, they, they kind of laugh, you know? <laughs> but uh, I remember I talked to this person and I asked them something about what is your philosophy on business. And I remember first giving. Sometimes they say you got to give something before you can get something, you know. And so I remember I told them I have this philosophy that the best way to make money is a win-win situation. Do you know that means if a group makes money, then everybody wins. And you have like something like that I remember saying to the guy. And the guy was so impressed. And what the guy told me back was something even next level then at the end of it he realized he was talking to me for like 15 minutes he laughed as if it was like he was talking to me like an old friend you know <laughs> and uh he gave me his card and there was an intense like email response from him back and forth pretty much he i, I had found a way into some sort of uh financial uh advisory path you know but um, anyways, what happened though was, uh, and what the guy told me, he told me a big lesson, a really huge lesson for business. He said, I want to hire someone who knows what my boss wants from me, what the higher levels want from me. I want to hire someone who knows what the higher levels want from me. That means someone who can even take care of the manager will become the best employee uh, for the manager that can think like the manager, you know? I mean, it depends on how insecure the manager is, you know. <laughs> There's a reason PhD, people with PhDs don't get hired, you know. The person's like, wait a minute, this guy's a PhD, he's going to take my job, you know. <laughs> Look at how flawed our, you know, corporate realms are. Holy
I think if everybody stays true to the nature of their design and values their existence, you know, that means it's as if like, you see a lot of people like, uh, if somebody speaks a rude to their family, they get angry, you know, they correct the person, right? Now, if some, if they themselves speak about the bad about themselves, do they correct it or not? You see. Something I had shared, I just remembered from other talks, is I had also said that corporate culture goes into this quest mode where people are not going to uh, work in the sense that they go work for years for a company doing the same thing, you know? Imagine every company has quests and anybody who has the skill and ability to do that quest can come and do that quest. Then people will have a resume from a variety of work experiences from different companies rather than getting stuck in one company and the years of their energetic expression going by. You know, in this life, it's not, you know, Alan Watts said, it, 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 see, see work as play and all your problems will be solved. You know, and some people said have said that if you, uh, find a job that you love. You don't have to work a day in your life. But I'll tell you that um, work is living. And I constantly try to think if we continue in the next 500 years what kind of culture, what kind of work would human beings be doing? How physical would they be? How multidimensional processing, how much would the brain evolve? Would we find a way to perfect our brains, imagine? Imagine we find some wave technology that you put this on any human brain and it just maximizes it to its full potential or something, you know? But I don't know. This life is more like poetry. It doesn't necessarily have a fixed meaning, but it means a lot. <laughs> Okay. So um, <clears throat> I would like to go into a code tunnel. A code tunnel is a, for whatever is new.
pretty much it's uh I read a bunch of quotes to see the inner realms of people. It's sometimes it's a theme, sometimes it's a specific person. For tonight it's uh kindness. Samuel Johnson, kindness is in our power, even when fondness is not. Unexpected kindness is the most powerful, least costly, and most underrated agent of human change. Bob Carey. Francis of Assisi, for it is in giving that we receive. Dante Alighieri, he who sees a need and waits to be asked for help is as unkind as if he had refused it. He who sees a need and waits to be asked for help is as unkind as if he had refused it. Yeah, if you can help someone, if you can help someone, and you don't, it's literally like... Uh, it's as if you haven't helped them. <laughs> that means, think of it this way. Life happens once every day for everyone. Everybody has a battle. They're fighting. We can't see if you can help your fellow member of civilization do so. If you can't, you know, then um, um, honestly say you can't, you know. Mark Twain says, kindness is the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Tiru Valduvar says, real kindness seeks no return. What return can the world make to rain clouds? Henry James, wow, 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 that previous quote just hit me. What return can the world make to rain clouds? A kindness that is raining down. And a kindness that's like perspiration. For example, you see this picture, just to make a point of the last thing, what return can the world make to rain clouds? Raining kindness. See, that's the whole point of it. In this thing, we see the technology in this picture I've chosen for this episode. It's as if they've made, what, what were they called, blimps? Um, It's as if if the ship falls, it falls into an ocean. Probably breaks by impact, but... It's just as if like a technology has been shared, now the whole civilization is advanced. It's like there's nothing, in, no such thing as power that can be held. Nobody can hold power. Power should be seen like a river. It is event-based. Pretty much I wanted to make a point about sharing being a sort of uh, winning of the long term. <clears throat> Henry James says three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. Well said. Because if we are not kind, we stop. So we, if we are not kind to man, we stop being mankind. We cannot see mankind. So as long as there's cruelty, you know, there's see, the issue with violence is that if somebody was violent in a video game, nobody cares, you know. But if the violence is in a way where it disturbs the evolutionary process of human beings, then it's like, uh, you know, something has to be done. Oscar Wilde says, the smallest act of kindness is worth more than the grandest intention.
Desmond Tutu says, do your little bit of good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. And guys, this goes, Desmond Tutu says this, but there was this story, I remember hearing it in my childhood in Iran, where um, <clears throat> there was this uh, dam, this water dam, and people have made, they made this dam. Now, this dam had a small hole, and there was this little bit of water leaking. And one person's like, what do we do with this hole? You know, and someone's like, it's nothing, man. Nothing's going to happen. You know? And they left. And little did they know that that one hole over time, drop, 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 suddenly, bam! You know, as if like an ant from Lord of the Rings just smashed the dam. You know? As if the ant didn't give a damn for the dam that, you know, stopped its life for <laughs> And Rice says, be kind, always, if you have a choice, be kind. Steve Marabali, Mar <laughs> a kind gesture can reach a wound that only compassion can heal. Beautiful sentence. A kind gesture can reach a wound that only compassion can heal. Steve Maraboli, every single time you help somebody stand up, you're helping humanity rise. Every single time you help somebody stand up, you are helping humanity rise. Isaac uh, Boshevis, singer. I don't know if singer is his last name or the title. Kindness I've discovered is everything in life. See, guys, everybody's just growing old and realizing it makes sense to be kind. I mean, what if we knew that when we were young, you know? <clears throat> Anonymous. I mean, should I do this? Okay, I'll pass this one. Scott Adams says, remember, there's no such thing as a... Actually, I'll read it. Anonymous says, <laughs> one of the most difficult things to give away is kindness. Usually, it comes back to you. Scott Adams. Remember the act of kindness. Every act creates a ripple with no logical end. Lao Tzu says, if a person seems wicked, do not cast him away. Awaken him with your words. Elevate him with your deeds. Repay his injury with your kindness. Do not cast him away. Cast away his wickedness. Wow. Lao Tzu says, kindness in words creates confidence. Kindness in thinking creates profoundness. Kindness in giving creates love. Sarah Fielding, <clears throat> the words of kindness are more healing to a drooping heart than balm or honey. Tenzin Gyatso, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. What an incredible sentence. Just the, the architecture of the sentence is incredible. I'm going to share it here for the audience. Charles Dickens. <clears throat> No one is useless in this world who lightens the burden of another. Anne Frank, no one has ever become poor by giving. Amy Leigh Mer Mercury, kindness can transform someone's dark moment with a blaze of light. 
You'll never know how much your caring matters. Make a difference for another today. Joseph Jubert. Kindness is loving people more than they deserve. Louis Richmond. Practice kindness, particularly when you feel irritated or things are not going well. Kindness hardly ever goes wrong. <clears throat> That's the thing, that kindness is an activity that its karmic like echo like it doesn't have a karmic echo it's like it's like energy that's not limited so it doesn't have a limited karma kevin heath no act of kindness is too small the gift of kindness may start as as a small ripple that over time can turn into a tidal wave affecting the lives of many george sand guard well within yourself that treasure kindness know how to give without hesitation how to lose without regret how to acquire without meanness george sand <clears throat> debbie mccomber mccomber you can't live a perfect day without doing something for someone who will never be able to repay you yeah guys here's the here's the algorithm even if you're like let's say not a kind person at heart but you're like okay what about this whole honor point thing i'll tell you this just do uh what feels just like how they say like you um the best way to take care of your body is to listen to your body <laughs> and when you don't listen there's consequences and that's definitely true what i'm saying add more dimensions to the day just dare to see who you are that is the joy of being here, really. The joy of being here is not your attention to be more so much on the outer realms that it forgets the inner realms and so much on the inner realms that it doesn't care for the outer realms anymore. We gotta find a balance. And that balance can only come from first noticing an obstacle and a challenge. <clears throat> that means you see like um Sometimes I look at nationalism and I'm like, wow, how much money has gone to military and how much of that money could have gone in actually updating the nation? It's remarkable that we are protecting ourselves from each other's misunderstanding, not realizing that we are the only ones on this rock. That whether, and it, because there's more people entering the system, we have to eventually get along. What, it's going to be Hunger Games? We are, uh, we, you know, we, so they made that movie so we can actually get a preview and do something, you know. And the strategy to overpopulation, of course, is sky cities, you know. <clears throat> Civilization 2.0. They need to be heard. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Kindness is the golden chain by which society is bound together. Author unknown. Oh my God, what is with these? Kindness like a boomerang always returns. Plato, be kind. For everyone you, you meet is fighting a harder battle. This quote, guys, will make you realize why you need to care for the unknown potential of human beings. And to live for who they will become, not for who they are now, for nobody is who they are now. It is just a mirage in the desert of our attention. The Wright brothers... They found a way to transcend jumping. And you can say we will find a way to transcend this jumping from ideology. I feel anything we put our attention on updates, if we actually become conscious of what is in the moment as us, 
and everybody starts journaling their inner realms and we create this giant archive. Albert Schweitzer, constant kindness can accomplish much. As the sun makes ice melt, kindness causes misunderstanding, mistrust. What? Constant kindness can accomplish much, much as the sun makes ice melt. Kindness causes misunderstanding, mistrust, and hostility to evaporate. Yeah, kindness is literally like there's no need to demonstrate power when you know you have power. Those who demonstrate power, those who show, they're trying to show their strength. I mean, what are you doing? Strength is like uh, literally you bring out you 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 bring out the sword when you're in battle. It's like we we, we the mind is something where um i think it should be actually administered through presence most of the day and certain moments it can be engaged as it can be it can move into uh the personifications of the linguistic simulation because honestly we're like atoms that named ourselves then named atoms you know like like this, this is next level, guys. You know, it's like this human game is not as it's not as easy as we think. You know, if we make the world seem too known, then we'll forget that the unknown is where it is how it evolved. <clears throat> Emmanuel, <clears throat> Emmanuel Swedenborg. What a name! Kindness is an inner desire that makes us want to do good things, even if we do not get anything in return. It is the joy of our life to do them. When we do good things from this inner desire, there is kindness in everything we think, say, want, and do. Yep, Aesop, A-E-S-O-P, um, Aesop's fables. He says, no act of kindness, no matter how small, is ever wasted. Mary Schmidt, don't be reckless with other people's hearts and don't put up with people that are reckless with yours. I mean, you got to have a bit more patience than that, Mary. <laughs> Catherine Stockett, all I'm saying is kindness don't have no boundaries. Yeah. Eric Hoffer says kindness can become its own motive. We are made kind by being kind. Khalil Gibran, the smallest act of kindness is worth more than the greatest intention. <clears throat> Rick Riordan, but remember, boy, that an act of, a, a, a kind act can sometimes be as powerful as a sword. Shannon L. 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 Alder, be kind to someone. Only to look kind to others defeats the purpose of being kind. <clears throat> Amelia er er Earhart, uh, a sing er Earhart. If she had an E, her last name would be two body organs. That's the next level. Amelia Earhart says a single act of kindness throws out roots in all directions and the roots spring up and make new trees it's as if she could hear her nature her heart Amelia, she's the pilot i think amelia Earhart. a single act of kindness kindness throws out uh, roots in all directions <clears throat> and the roots spring up and make new trees franklin d roosevelt Human kindness has never weakened the stamina or softened the fiber of a free people. A nation does not have to be cruel to be tough. Can somebody please post this, you know, share this quote on social media so certain people see it? <laughs> Uh, 
hundred percent if Franklin D. Roosevelt wasn't like a, a leader, he would probably be like a philosopher, you know, like someone, a scholar. Jean Malouf, kindness holds the key to the secret of our own transformation and in the process of the transformation of the world. <clears throat> Khalil Gibran says, tenderness and kindness are not signs of weakness and despair, but manifestations of strength and resolution. Gordon B. Hinckley, our kindness may be the most persuasive argument for that which we believe. A little kindness from person to person is better than a vast love for all humankind. A little kindness from person to person, it's not better than a vast love for all humankind because the kindness from human person to person leads to the vast love. So eventually, if, so you, it doesn't matter how do you consider the vast love. You know, Richard Damwell says that. Uh, that was my commentary on it. But it's an interesting quote. Ralph Waldo Emerson says, You cannot do a kindness too soon, for you never know how soon it will be too late. Franklin D. Roosevelt, If you treat people right, they will treat you right, 90% of the time. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi, The simple acts of kindness are by far more powerful than a thousand uh, heads bowing in prayer. Yeah. If you pray, but you don't notice the world you're in, I mean, what do you, where are you even praying? <laughs> you know, there was this picture that showed back in the day, people were praying for better weather, but they were destroying trees to make temples to go and pray for better weather. You know, you know intelligence is, is the true gift of the realm. <clears throat> There's a story I'm going to share, guys, before I wrap this up. There are three generals, and their armies, there are allies. Their armies are at this mountain, you know, and they're sitting at a table drinking. These three generals that are drinking, one of the generals, they're very egotistical, you know. So <laughs> one of the generals turns around to the other general and says, hey, you know, they've, they've had so many shots, let's say, shots of vodka or something. And so one general says, um, my men are so loyal. Sorry, my men are so brave. Sorry, it's just a second I'm looking for something. Um, sorry guys, let me see if I can catch the train of thought. Um, Okay, so um, three generals, these three generals, 
<clears throat> one of them says, let me show you how honorable my men are. How, sorry, how brave my men are. And he says, soldier! <clears throat> and his soldier runs, you know. And the soldier's like, yes, sir. You know, and, and the general says, you see this cliff? I want you to jump to the other side of that cliff. And the soldier just says, yes! You know, yes, sir! You know, and he runs out the, runs on the, you know, towards the edge of the cliff and jumps and it's an impossible feat. Like, it's impossible to do it, but he still does it and he jumps and he's like, ah, like he falls down and dies, you know. And then the general looks around and he says, that soldier knew it was impossible, but he was so brave he did it. You know, that's how loyal my men are. <clears throat> And then the other general, who's there, they're all drinking. And the third general in the back is just drinking more than the rest. It's just quiet. You know, the two general. And the second general is like, let me show you how brave my men are. And he says, soldier. You know, and his soldier comes, okay. <laughs> Soldier's like, yes, sir. You know, and he's like, soldier, you see that minefield? Go there and dance. Dance like you're a free bird. You know. <laughs> and the soldier's like, yes, sir. You know, he just runs, and this soldier runs into the battlefield and actually dances as if he's closed his eyes and is remembering his wedding day or something. In a minefield, he's dancing. His foot hits a mine. The soldier is gone. Second general turns to the first general, turns to two, two other generals and says, that's how, that's true bravery. You know, that's bravery right there. You know, that guy was the person who planted the field. He knew where all the mines were. He could have danced in a way where he could have dodged it, you know. But I told him to dance like a free bird, so he closed his eyes and actually danced, you know. And he forgot about the mines. So that's true bravery, true loyalty. <clears throat> and then the third general is quiet, and then that suddenly the two generals suddenly look at the third general. And they're like, hey, how about you? You know, how about your men? How brave are your men? And he's like, my men are brave. I, it's fine. I don't know. It's okay. You know? <laughs> and they're like, no, tell us. You have to show it. You know, they're all drunk. And he's like, no, it's fine, guys. My men are brave. I know they're brave. You know, I, I don't need to show it. But eventually, they kind of, the two generals are like, no, you have to, after our demonstrations, then you can't sit at our table, like some inconvenience. <clears throat> and the third general's like, okay, and the third general's like, soldier, you know, and his soldier comes, you know. <laughs> and the general says, like, there, there's a waterfall beside where their table is and their armies are settled. And the soldier says... <laughs> Uh, the general says, soldier, you see that waterfall? Just jump into it like it's a swimming pool. Okay? And the soldier looks at the general. And the two generals are like, okay, that's intense. You know? And the soldier turns around and says, I won't do anything stupid like that. <laughs> I think I heard this story from Sadhguru, to be honest. But like... <laughs> And the third general looks at the other two drunk generals and he says, that's true pain. You know, he actually looked at the situation to see if it made sense rather than just being blind passion towards a, uh, uh, an effect where you haven't even noticed the cause, you know. You know, we shouldn't live our, uh, artificially intelligent before actually artificial intelligence has properly opened its eyes. It's like it's at a time where human intelligence needs to survive. And it's weird because people, I think there's no instruction booklet. There's no easy way out. It's like an event-based living thing, you know. <clears throat> However, we know this, that the mind seems to be the control center to some degree. And what that means is your attention. If you can pilot your attention, if you can just, just throughout your time, life, maybe you're a busy person, you've been a busy CEO or something, it does, it's fine. In your lunch break, at your coffee, whenever you have like 10 minutes or something, like for me, this would be incredible. If I see in the future, all the most uh, big CEOs of companies, 
you know, they just take off their shoes, you know, and they go sit on a field of grass and they just meditate. They just sit there and be there as a human being, you know, because anytime you chase something for too long, you forget the, your own pace as a soul. So that's the thing, even if you are, maybe there's a b billions of religious people on the planet, if you're a religious person, you're, even from a religious perspective, they, if there's a, a lines in many, I, I'm pretty sure and there, there's something around these lines and uh, accurately, I'm, I'm, like, I'm bold enough to, to say it. Um, <clears throat> where it can be said that it's as if the creator gave the creator intelligence so it can use it. That means you don't have a mind to just watch. You have a mind to use it, you know. It's literally like our, I honestly, my, my personal view is that uh, the mind is a field. And uh, it's a field. So it's not a shape or an object or subject. And... The body is uh, passing through this field. So there's no such thing as a body. We are a dynamic event recorder. We are an event that is recording its dynamic change. Technically, we're con energy. Imagine energy can be created or destroyed, just changes from one form to another. In the law of thermodynamics, we can say attention is energy but it's recording and it's backup, like where the recording of its eyes are going is not here. So honestly, I feel we are um, behind our eyes. Um, we are the goggles of higher dimensions. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Um, we can totally design uh, uh, giant events of kindness. If we get this honor point system going, people are going to be like, no way. I pick up like a piece of trash and it gives me some honor point. And then it's like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's just that we just need to um, be smart about the, the way we present the desire that the desire in some sense becomes a win-win situation. A win-win for the individual and the collective. Right now, individual desires are causing the collective to lose. Human beings, it's easier for us to be chaotic animals than ordered human beings. You know? And to bring order, you have to, like, everything in life can descend to randomity. So you have to maintain yourself. And how you maintain yourself is by having a will. <clears throat> so imagine you have free will, but you don't want to do anything in this world. How hilarious would it be? It's like, then why do you have free will? You know, <laughs> you know so free will is, is really the, it's like the meaning. It's like life, we, we thought life was like a book we had to find truth in. But really life is like an empty canvas where it's, the truth is being experientially painted in every moment. So it's uh it's remarkable. It's like in 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 our behave in 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 our collective behavioral psychology. I think we are seeing uh, the shadow of higher dimensional intelligence. But it's complex, and language has to evolve. And there's so many ways the world can move. <clears throat> so, anyways, guys, um, thanks for tuning in. Um, I wanted to share something. I was thinking of maybe taking a vacation from these talks. I mean, not per se a vacation, but I start like uh, the, usually like way before I started live. The live streams actually started since I think the five hundred talks. Oh, sorry, one thousand, one thousand five. No, 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 500, yeah.
800, I think, 800, I started doing the live stream. Anyways, guys, a lot of things. Time is their authorization. Unconditional freedom, unconditional kindness, unconditional discipline. Morality is the mind's storytelling, like the mind is speaking uh, a language of uh, stillness. The body is speaking a language of movement. I don't know. I mean, when I when I think about the unknown witness, what can it do with knowledge? Like, what can you do with truth? If truth is an object, objects are temporary. So your truth is temporary. If truth is a subject, subjects are as temporary as the person looking at him. So subjects are temporary. So the only thing that in this life could potentially not be temporary and that could be unconditional, that can, that is, that has neither been born or can't die, is the unconditional view of the conditions of our life, the unconditional mystery, the unknown mystery. The unknown is the teacher after uh, knowledge, I find. That's the next thing for a multidimensional being, the unknown is the, it's always speaking. Yeah. And as Plato says, time is the moving image of eternity. So next time people ask what time it is, you tell them Plato's code. Yeah. <laughs> it's eternity time, man. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. Bye.